Hello, and thank you for tuning into McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight we are doing things a little bit differently. Since we can't be with you live, we have pre recorded this show so that we can still check in with you and ask your questions anyway. We didn't want to miss that Sunday, so we thought we would do it ahead of time. So thank you all for being here. Hello, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Oh, you're you're so honest, Heather. I would have just tried to fool them. <laughs> I think they would have yeah. known that we weren't live. Well, you know, anyway, yeah, we have a good following and uh, we're here live with you every, every Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time, free, open to the public, a place that encourages you to bring friends and relatives to see what John and Mary and Heather are up to in terms of uh, regaining your lost health and appearance. And Heather has so many questions I know. That, that people send to her all the time that we could we could be doing shows for months. Yes. You never yeah. run out of questions. And there are lots of resources. You know, there's the McDougall site, which I spent uh, since 2002 building and Heather's been working on for the last three years. But everybody that visits our site, particularly professional people, think it's a really, really nicely done site. So that's drmcdougall.com. <clears throat> There's, uh, well, let's see, many years of newsletters. Good to grief. I started them in 2002. So I quit in 2017. So that, you know, that's a few decades of newsletters. And then we have uh, the YouTube presentations, which I've been offering. So anytime you're interested in any problems you have, you go look up at McDougall and diabetes, McDougall and heart disease and so on. And now what I'm doing is I'm putting together a series and we're going to be broadcasting this series in July. Uh, the intention is to make as impactful a uh, presentation to people, your friends, your relatives, and to my colleagues. It's called McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion, which is what that national best-selling book was of mine that I wrote, McDougall's Medicine. Nothing, hardly anything's changed at all since then. I just have a few things to add but, you know, the truth is the truth is the truth. So, you know, last week or so, a couple of weeks ago, I went over with you the business of chest pain and why they do um, why, why they do heart surgery. And heart surgery is to relieve chest pain. But, but I made a statement to you. I made a statement that it doesn't save lives. Now, I'm going to try and explain to you this as succinctly as possible. I don't expect you to get all of this, but you have a pause button on your, on your, when you're playing YouTube. And so when I tell you something, you can go look it up or rewatch it. This is particularly intended for cardiologists, people interested <laughs> in heart surgery, bypass surgeons, et cetera. I'm going to talk to you about why heart surgery fails always. We'll so start... this would be something that someone could take into their cardiologist. Oh, they could if they wanted to, yeah. Why are you recommending this? I don't know. I don't know. All right, well, let's see if we can get this going, see if we have any luck with our slide presentation this time. Uh, you got a good view of me, Heather? Perfect. All right. So anyway, this is a disease. It's atherosclerosis. It's due to injury of your arteries by your fork and spoon primarily. Smoking may have something to do with it. That's always been the, the scapegoat. What, although people who smoke cigarettes at, at a high incidence in countries where they eat a starch-based diet rarely have heart disease. So, you know, just I, like I said, I think it's kind of a, a little bit of sending you in a different direction than your dinner plate, but it's the food that causes this. And what happens is you develop inflammation and this inflammation leads to primarily hard fibrous material that's calcified, but also it leads to some volatile plaques. So we're gonna talk about the end of this presentation. So the way you see these, uh, these volatile plaques, excuse me, the, the non-lethal the non scars, is you do an angiogram, or you can do an ultrafast CT scan, which is this is, you see a picture of the heart, you can see the arteries here. They just, I mean, it looks like you're holding your heart in your hand. And then you see over here, a detail of the artery, which has scars in it, and also calcification. These are scars, just like, just like if you, if you, you banged your head on the cement when you fell off your bicycle, you get a scar, it would heal and be solid. That's what these are, they're scars. And they start with injury. Injury is, like I say, from the fork and spoon. Injury leads to inflammation, which leads to scar tissue and calcification. You get inflammation in your lungs from tuberculosis, you get miliary calcifications. 
You get inflammation in your bursa, bursa your tendon. You get calcifications. You get inflammation in your breasts that you see on a mammogram. They're looking at calcifications in your breast ducts. This is hard, fibrous, rocky material, perfectly stable. And that's what they bypass on. That's what they do bypass surgery on. So uh, what will happen is uh, typically, and I've seen this happen so many times before, and it's actually taught informally in medical schools, is we have a sales pitch going on to the husband or the wife when they have, uh, you know, they have a problem. Let's just let's imagine this is a husband that's laying there in the bed, just had a heart attack. The well-meaning heart doctor uh, comes into the room, uh, says hello to the wife and husband and says, ma'am, can I can you come over here and take a look at this? I want to show you your husband's heart. You see these lesions here? And what I'm pointing at is uh, with the arrows I'm pointing at, hard fiber scars, okay? We call these plaques, ma'am. Now, this is the blockages in your heart's arteries. Doesn't mention that it's hard fiber scar, perfectly stable and non-lethal. And then maybe the doctor will say something like, you know what we call these lesions, ma'am? We've got a special name for these. We call these... <laughs> Widowmakers. Widowmakers. I mean, most of you that. know this, widowmakers. And, and it's, it, it's, that's the way the sales pitch goes. But let's look at the reality of the situation. Uh, what they're looking at here is they're taking a catheter and putting it through the leg, okay, up here through the leg and into the heart. And then they blow dye into the arteries and they see blockages. These are hard fiber scars, these blockages. Look here on my left. And they blow up a balloon and they fracture, they fracture the scar. And as a result of fracturing the scar, you release products of injury, which cause the blood to clot. Half the arteries so treated are completely closed down in five months. So what we did to counteract that problem is we put stents after we blew up the plaque, burst the plaque. We put stents in, which are kind of like a Chinese, a Chinese puzzle. And you prop the artery open. Well, that's good because it helps keep the artery open, maybe prevents the clots, but it causes smooth muscle proliferation. So 40% of the cases that are so treated with these stents are closed down within a year. So I just want to clarify. So in this one over here on the left, left, that's why they're seeing it too. Yeah. That's something that they just put through the, the leg. Yeah. And they popped it, popped it open and then they pulled it out again. That's right. And the bottom one is where they inserted the catheter and they left it there. Right. They pulled, they pulled the balloon out and they left the... They left the stand. Ah, yeah. okay. And it never comes out, Mary. Okay. You can't have that taken out. All right. So anyways, they took care of the hard, fibrous, non-lethal, stable plaques. Seems right. reasonable that it would work. Seems logical, doesn't yeah. it? Except I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation, but it doesn't kill. See, here's the plaques. Uh, here's the procedure where you put the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the stent in, the metal stent. And you go in here, you blow oh, it up. Yeah, I see that? All right. Okay, then because these stents, uh, they cause uh -huh. the smooth muscle cells to proliferate and close the arteries, what we do is we coat these stents with uh, cancer drugs. They're called drug-eluting stents, and they keep the, the cells from proliferating for, say, three, four, five months. But anyway, you're left with this particular stent. They're very complex. This costs $30,000 if all goes well. Let's take a look at uh, the results. I'm going to go through all the studies with you. And this is what I want you to kind of, you got it on recording. You don't have to watch it again. Show it to your favorite doctor. You could be a cardiologist and tell me whether I missed something. You know, because I'm talking about your business. I'm talking about you making a half a million dollars a year. Let's take a look at the research that has been done on doing angioplasty, angioplasty for chronic coronary artery disease. We have the OAT study here which did not reduce the occurrence of death or infarction or heart failure. That was one of the early studies done. And then they did the COURAGE study, 2,300 people, same thing, no reduction of death, heart attacks, and they had the same risk of having further cardiovascular surgery. Then you go on to a review. This is an early review, it was done in 2012, 12 randomized trials, 8,000 people, no benefit, no reduction in mortality, no reduction in death. All right, so they do another review, 14 randomized trials, same thing. Routine revascularization was not related to improved survival. I'm showing you the results. There's nothing hidden here. All right, so then you go on long-term results. How about up to 15 years? Maybe we see the benefit 15 years later. Nope, nope, did not find any survival difference there. 
So uh, let's take a look at arteries that are totally concluded, occluded. I mean, they're just 100% blocked up. Then we opened up 100%. How about if we could get these people alive a little longer? Nope, didn't do that either. <laughs> no reduction in mortality, in other words, death. All right. So how about some really sick people? Because you can show benefits when a therapy has just a tiny benefit. You can show it on really, really sick people. So how about terrible diabetics who have horrible disease? Well, let's see, randomized trial, no difference in death rates or major. There you go. Let's see, that was on in 2009. Uh, how about people who have severe heart failure? Okay, and that was done in 2022, okay? Revascularization by PCI, that's angioplasty, did not result in lower incidence of death from any cause or hospitalization for heart failure. Ladies and gentlemen, I have showed you all the studies, okay? You didn't see one that even slightly suggests this procedure works. Why does it not work? Because they're treating hard fibrous old scars. But it's business. I mean, they do a million of these a year in the United States. I, I love this um, Annals of Internal Medicine letter to the editor. I just want to, you know, they talk about how it doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, back then in 1992, you know, it doesn't work. And then they go on and say, well, why do they keep doing so, so many of these? And the title of the uh, letter to the editor is Money Fun and Angioplasty, PCI, Percutaneous Intervention, Coronary Intervention. That's what it's called. You know, why, why do they keep doing these? They're doing a, a million dollars. Uh, they're doing a million a year. They're doing a hundred million dollars in, well, more than that. I'm not going to do the math for you. <laughs> but look what they say. We suggest that the co combination of three factors, never so closely associated before in the history of medicine, has been synergistic in promoting coronary angioplasty. These are the three things. It's very lucrative. Patients are mostly self-referred. And it's fun. I mean, you go into an operating theater and everybody claps. And they just have a great old time. But you pay the price. All right, uh, so this has not uh, escaped the attention of organizations like the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. In 2007, they told doctors to stop doing these procedures. They stop. didn't, though. <laughs> two, two studies looked at it. Here are the studies. And uh, they concluded that, this is in the discussion, there was no change. Even though they told them to stop doing these procedures that don't work, there was no change in behavior. And the editorial is because of personal financial gain that they ignored this, the recommendations of this large, these two large bodies. It's, it's the money. All right, let me explain to you why it doesn't work. It's because they're treating the non-lethal part of the disease. I'm gonna show you what the killing part of the disease is and you'll understand. Remember, they're treating old fiber scars. That's what they're, that's what they're squashing and stinting and <laughs> drug eluding and all that stuff with, right? All right, so this is the development of atherosclerosis and you can see the, the deposits of scar in the uh, arteries. Well, <clears throat> here's an acute pustule. You see this right here? So you see this pustule? This is, this is pus, this is white blood cells. This forms as a result of injury from uh, slivers of cholesterol and globs of fat that get under the artery walls. And they form these festering sores. And what happens is these festering sores, they pop like a pimple on a teenager's face. And that sudden rupture, let's go through the, let's go through the areas here. Uh, you start out with a healthy looking artery. See this, this thin layer, it gets injured by, uh, by the fork and spoon primarily, maybe products of cigarette smoke combustion, maybe autoimmune reactions. And you develop this sore, the sore gets bigger, and then it develops a little fistula and the inner contents of semi-liquid necrotic material comes spurting out like a rupture on a teenager's face, just comes spurting out and they cause the blood to clot. And here's a picture from a book I published in 1996, showing you the same thing. You develop these plaques and then they clot. Here, here's what happens here. Uh, you have the artery. This is an artery section. It grows a plaque. See that? Okay. And then what happens is you develop a crack in the plaque and then you form this blood clot. And right here we go. Just a second. Come on, little <laughs> fellow. There you go. See, there we are. See? And the blood clots. All right. And then what lies distal dies. And that's it, folks. That's why they're doing a hundred billion dollar a year business at your expense. And there are consequences of surgery in addition to the fact 
that you're wasting an awful lot of money and time and suffering some pain is uh, you've been not, not been led to what really does solve the problem. And this is a reversible disease. This is an entirely preventable disease. Populations of people throughout history who've eaten a starch-based diet do not get this disease. Okay, that's my speech for today. <laughs> I'm happy to answer some questions. That was great. You explained it so well, Dad. And I just can't believe that this is not common knowledge. It's just the reason. I, I can't so clear. I, I see this stuff and I, it's just, it's so obvious. Oh, well. And I, I just, you know, I feel sorry for people that are railroaded into these surgeries without knowing what's really going on. And they don't ask either. They believe no, in the doctors. I know they believe in the, the doctors. doctors are next to God. Well, I'll tell you, you show any of your doctors what I just shared with you, or the presentation that Heather and I are putting together for July and August, uh, which really, really challenges the heart business and the cancer business and the diabetes business and the obesity business. And it's <laughs> going to be a good fun five hours of presentation. I'm excited. Uh, that starts July 29th. So we'll be sending out an ad about that on Saturday. Oh, yeah, and, and I'm going after my colleagues, too. We're going to be offering CME credit eventually for this series of lectures. And uh, that We're means... going after them to educate them, not to, not to go after them to... Thank you, Mary. It sounded <laughs> like you were, you were going after them. I mean, you're going after them to try and yeah. bring them into the fold, yeah, right? Yeah, because you know, general practitioners, family practitioners, uh, internists, they don't make money off doing this. No. You know, it's just the cardiologists and the heart surgeons that have this huge business going. Uh, you know, they, you, you, we'll, maybe we'll talk about hearts. Thank you for correcting me on that. I don't want <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, look, you, I'm, I'm, I'm going for my patients. I, you know, whoever is not telling you the truth, I'm, I'm out to straighten that out. You know, if, it's all there. Yeah, there's nothing you will find. I do want to mention one thing, though. This is for chronic coronary artery disease. When it comes to acute problems, like if you suddenly have a heart attack, and that means you have chest pain. If you get to the hospital right away, then they can do something. Then all that rigmarole, all that procedure may result in you sparing some heart muscle, maybe result in you staying alive longer, not dying, maybe. But you got to get there within 90 to 120 minutes, or otherwise the clot is fully organized. The muscle of your heart is dead. So if you don't get there within certainly six hours, you're toast. Well, six it's, hours is a lot different than ninety minutes. Well, it depends on who you look at. I give them say I've given them. I'm giving them six hours. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's it's, better. It's, I mean, I'm thinking about. I mean, sometimes you can't even get an ambulance to come within ninety seconds or ninety minutes. Ninety minutes to one hundred twenty. The general the general thoughts on how quick you have to get to the operating room table. But I give them a little extra. Uh, time. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm trying to be good to my colleagues. Well, but would. The other thing I would wonder about is if you if you actually managed to get to the hospital in that length of time, would somebody would anyone at the hospital realize that you had to get oh, in there? Oh yeah, the oh yeah, the emergency room is really set. Oh they are. Oh yeah, because they realize this is some a place where you can do some good, and so they're they're set to, to get you to so the if ER. So got to the ER, yeah. you would be guaranteed. You'll be, you be if they there. suspect you have a heart attack, you're gonna go okay. right up to the right, right up to the camp lab. Yeah. But the, see, you're talking about a small percentage of people. Yeah. You know, you're not talking about 90, 95, 98 percent of the heart surgeries that are done, which is what I just talked well, about. Well, don't you think that? I mean, I, I mean, at least I've heard. I don't know. I've never had one, but I, I mean, I hear about people that have a heart attack and they don't even realize twenty percent that so, they've had a heart attack. So between ten and twenty percent don't realize they've had, a or heart they think it's not that bad, so yeah. they can. They don't have to rush. And right. When you things. do an EKG or some other type of test to look at dead heart muscle, yeah, you find ten to twenty percent of people have silent heart attacks. Okay. Well, so, I, I got a, I got a good idea. Why don't we just not do this? <laughs> you know, why don't we just stay healthy, uh, avoid the damage? We know what causes it. It's the unhealthy Western diet, the meat, the dairy, you know, the vegetable oils and all that stuff. Just don't do it. And you don't have to learn about the heart business. <laughs> but see, you know, you're looking at a situation where half the people that live in the United States die prematurely of heart attacks or strokes. So you can imagine how many people are walking around, like 150 million people with artery disease that 
that don't you know, know. that eventually will manifest itself. Half of them are going to die prematurely of heart attacks and strokes. So if I went out on the street and I just did random angiograms or treadmill tests. Well, you'd find half the people uh, have blocked arteries. Basically, everybody would flock it. And they've tried to do that. Uh, the, the cardiologist, because, you know, you got to get business in. So we go, we go out and we cast large nets over the population of, and we do it by testing. It used to be back 30, 35 years ago that, you know, if you were a male my age or younger, you'd get a treadmill stress test as a screen to see whether or not you had coronary artery disease. But like, for example, a women, half the women who fail, there's nothing wrong with them. And it's it, it looks at old disease, this treadmill test. And so if they find any disease on you, it's going to be the kind that falls in the untreatable category because they're old scars. The kind you find, you know, that you want to run to the hospital for are excruciating, like some elephant sat on your chest, chest pain. What about the, the new things that come out, the little credit card things that have two little things you put your fingers on? Would they well, help? I got two little things you put your fingers on. <laughs> these arteries right here. Well, this, this, you know, they sell these little things. You know, they're 100 bucks. On them and is they're, they're supposed to tell you whether you're having a heart attack or no, they don't do that. Well, I suppose you could. You could read ST depression if you were really good, but they're mainly for rhythms. And what they're trying to tell you is uh, if you get atrial fib, which a lot of people do, maybe 30% of the population as they grow older, get an irregular rhythm called atrial fibrillation. And you can detect that by doing this rhythm strip. That's about all. But and I, and it I, isn't going to help you anyway. I can tell whether you have atrial fib just by going like this. I can feel it. I can tell. Yeah. It's an irregular, regular pulse. So save your hundred bucks, or you might find it a good. Well, I'll tell you what I'll end up doing more of. I will end up doing more trips, trips to your doctor's office, more worry, more sleepless nights, more. If you're going to go into the medical business, they're going to find you. Remember, half the people have an artery disease. So there, you, you know, if you look, you're going to find. So you end up in a in some type of diagnostic center, you're you're you should be in up for the expectation that there's going to be something wrong. Because for most of us, there are. You know, almost nobody is is free of imperfections. And if they look hard enough, they'll find something to treat. <laughs> you have drilled that into my mind, Dad. Oh, <laughs> well, never... there, there are reasons, there are reasons to <laughs> seek medical attention, and they're obvious. I mean, if you're bleeding to death, if you have excruciating pain. You know, I mean, the body's smart. It knows when it's in trouble. You know, it's been doing this for like millions of years. Maybe millions, long time. <laughs> long time. Long time it's been doing this. So. Okay, great. Are you ready for some questions? We've got lots. I'm over ready, yes. All right, here we go. This a little first... long, I know. <laughs> this first one's from Martina. She wants to know what you think about the BMI standards. According to them, she is underweight, but she's healthy, active, and feels great. Well, there's been a lot of argument about BMI. It's uh, you take your height and you square your weight in kilograms, something like that, and divide <laughs> one by the other. <laughs> Anyways, it's a, it's a way of, of trying to match weight to height and get some idea whether or not uh, you're obese. Um, it doesn't reflect well very muscular people. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, they could have a lot of muscle and have a, a lot of weight and not be very tall, and they'd have a high BMI, you know, with a lot of muscle. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, normal BMI, I think it's 17% uh, for a woman, man, maybe 22%. 30%, you're obese. 35%, you're morbidly obese. 40%, 50%. You know, you're you're 35 to 50%. You're your operating room material. You, they're, they're pushing bariatric surgery at you. No, right, but what about this person who is under? Uh, her BMI is low. So stop, stop getting BMIs. <laughs> stop, stop doing the calculation. Yeah. Look in the mirror. I have said this before in debate situations. I remember one of the women, one of the men that debated me was a, a naturopath who was about a hundred pounds overweight, and he got the question. Uh, how, how do you diagnose obesity? He started out by talking about, well, you know, we have measurements, we have BMIs and so on. And I just said, well, why don't you take off your clothes and look at the mirror? I thought it was a good answer. <laughs> Perfect definition. <laughs> I, I don't know. 
Oh, I didn't really well, mean she it. She does that say, say that she feels great. She's got lots of energy. So I think that would be a good a good indicator. If you like what you see on the other side of the mirror, you're doing okay. Great. Thank you. Aren't there studies that show that underweight people live longer? Well, actually, they, they kind of have a U-shaped curve. In other words, uh, people who are a desirable weight usually live longer. Oh, okay. Under see, because underweight reflects people who have cancer and chronic disease. Yeah, but cirrhosis of the liver. Studies that that are shown that for elderly people, they're supposed to eat fewer calories, so they weigh less or something. Well, that's because the fat ones died. Oh, okay. The sick ones died. That's why older people. <laughs> That's why that's why risk factors don't count much in older people because the people who it counted for like high cholesterol <laughs> they're already they're dead, dead. <laughs> they they took them out of the assessment pool <laughs> they're gone so if you get to be 75 80 years old you have a cholesterol of 250 or 300 they already killed the sensitive <laughs> ones that's terrible yeah, I don't know well, it says something about living longer yeah you, you beat the odds. <laughs> Okay, so thank I, you. I, I, I don't know whether I answered the question. Or not, I, <laughs> look at Walter Kempner's research in my November 2016 newsletter. Look at what Walter Kempner said you should be as far as your height and weight go. That's those are good records. I, you know, both Mary and I, we flunked the Walter Kempner test. We're thinner than he says we should be. But you know, I I feel good about my weight, and I, I think you do too, Mary. So but anyway, that will give you some reassurance that you're not too thin as the Kempner, the Kempner uh, charts, November 2016 newsletter. Great, that's helpful, thank you. This next question is from Jill. She just read your latest lecture on vitamin D. She spends the entire summer outdoors, takes a beach vacation midwinter. However, her vitamin D is still low. Should right. she be concerned? No, no, no. Vitamin D tests are highly unreliable. And um, I mean, if you really, really do terrible on a D test, say your, your level is like, you know, eight nanograms per milliliter, eight nanograms per milliliter, that's, that's really low. And they say low is below 20. And you know, some some people say low is below thirty, and some say below is below sixty or ninety. So, so what would you do? Make sure you get plenty of sun. Well, if you get as much sun well, as you can possibly get, and you're well, 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 I guess I guess the question is, is what are we trying to treat? Are we trying to make the vitamin D levels look better in the on our next blood test? Are we trying to be, have good health? Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, one of the things that I want to share with you is that when you're unhealthy overweight, have heart disease, arthritis, inflammatory reactions, and so on, your uh, vitamin D is artificially re repressed on the blood test. You're, it's artificially low because inflammation results in byproducts that lower the vitamin D level on a test. So you have to be trim and healthy to have any semblance of what the vitamin D level is in terms of your own personal health. Uh, it, uh, there was a study done in Hawaii where they looked at uh, the people who are on the average age, oh, I don't know, they're about 40 years old, and they, they spend an average of 29 hours a week out in the sun. And half of them flunked the vitamin D test. And many of them were surfers. You know, you flunked the vitamin D test once yeah. and you spend your time in the sun. But they're unreliable. Well, that's but, what I would say is yeah. why okay. they have and, the vitamin and, D and, test. And then the next don't. <laughs> and then the, look, the, the, the Medicare won't pay for them. Okay, uh, the was AARP re recommends against them. I may have that wrong. And one of the organizations, I can look it up. I was just looking at. It. I should have remembered it. <laughs> Anyways, it's 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 condemned. Medicare won't pay for it. And won't pay for the testing or or the treatments. And besides that, to take to, to, the option would be the only option given you is to take pills or shots. And the pills and shots, after you after you take more than say 800 international units, you increase your risk of fractures and falls. So if you're going to take any vitamin D supplements to make the numbers look better, don't take more than a thousand international units. 800 is, you know, some of the research says over 800 will increase your risk of falls and fractures. 
but certainly over a thousand units. You say, well, how do I get a thousand units? Well, most supplements for sale are 5,000 units. What's mom looking at? Uh, I'm looking up vitamin D tests. I mean, you can you can do vitamin, you can buy your own vitamin D test out from Amazon. Oh, sure. So, yeah. yeah. So how can we um, trust that they're reliable? Don't, they're, don't, don't. They're, need, trying to, to spend, they're trying to, oh, they tell, they sell something along with it. You, you need, sunshine <laughs> is essential. Vitamin D is just one of the issues. You know, this has to do with your circadian rhythm, jet lag, it has to do with your immune system. Sunshine lowers your blood pressure, raises your good cholesterol, uh, lowers your pulse rate, it, it improves your mood, uh, relieves depression. I mean, it's an amazing, important part of life. You know, in addition to the vitamin D tests that are making billions of dollars for people, the testing, the supplements, the doctor's visits. Yeah, I think billions of dollars is fair to say. <laughs> Probably. Maybe only hundreds of millions. But anyways, it's 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 nonsense. It's done do more does more harm than good. That's one of those areas I'll be talking about when we give that series of lectures. Great, thank you. This next question is from Mary. She has been told that her type two diabetes was probably caused by a multiple toxic mold infestation in her house. Can diet help this, and how? Why would they ask Mary that? No, it's Mary. Mary wrote this in. <laughs> I was going to say, what do you become an expert on molds? Oh, look, Mary. Are you, are you an expert on molds? No, I'll pass on that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know of any molds causing diabetes. I, well, never, I was going to say that too. I've never heard that. <laughs> but, you know, there's lots of things that I'm not aware of. So it could be. Would the diet help that? Yeah, well, what else is going along with it? Do you have type 2 diabetes? In other words, you're overweight and you have elevated blood sugar, or type one and a half, and you're overweight and have elevated blood sugar, or are you underweight or normal weight, or even overweight and have type one diabetes? You know, the diet, even for a type one diabetic, which makes a person who makes no insulin at all, the diet's crucial because it prevents complications. You know, within 17 to 20 years, most diabetics have suffered blindness, kidney failure, heart attacks, increased risk of cancer, dead, you know, this is a very, very difficult disease to live with. So even a type 1 diabetic, will, I, I've often said I'd rather take care of a type 1 diabetic who always has to take insulin their whole life. They're never going to get off of it. They'll take fewer units under the good diet, but they always have to take it. But they are some of the most rewarding people to care for because they have so much to lose, you know, gangrene in their feet and all kinds of problems. So much to lose, and yet if they do something cost-free, you know, I'm not trying to tell you it's easy, not in our society, but something that's important, which eat a good diet, you'll live a full lifetime without any complications. So yeah, you have to follow the diet. Will it cure type two diabetes? Yeah, 100%. Will it cure what, what type one and a half? Yeah, that's a whole lot of discussion. <laughs> a little bit, cures it a little bit. Probably might have to take a little insulin too, type one and a half. I got a whole lecture on that too. That'll be part of the series as well. Yeah. Part of the series as well, <laughs> where I'm going to go after my colleagues and try and convince them in a friendly, po politically correct manner. That's right. That they need to learn this for their patient. I, I have to believe, and I know you're a big advocate of it, Heather, because you get to see other physicians uh, in, in a different different type of situation than I do. When I see uh, a patient cared for. Even by a doctor who is well-meaning, I just go, wow, you know, you could have offered him so much more. You know, why, why don't you tell him about the diet? You know, I, well, well, because they won't listen. They don't really care. They're not going to do anything. I can't get anybody to eat different. I'm not going to, why would I waste my time? It took some of my time to talk to my patients. You know, why didn't you tell them about the diet, huh? Because that, they don't know. Well, that's what I'm trying to do with this series of five lectures is to make my colleagues understand they have a powerful, the most powerful tool in medicine. I can't remember, I remember in Hawaii, at Tripler Medical Center, I gave a lecture to the Hawaii uh, Dietetic Association. There are a couple hundred dietitians there, Hawaii Dietetic Association. And I got up on stage and I said, the first thing that I want to tell you is you have more to offer patients 
than anybody else in the medical business. And that's because you know diet therapy or you should know it. And I tried to explain to them, you know, you with your knowledge can cure so much, relieve so much suffering and pain. But, you know, what do you do? You go out and you go on the floors and or go in an office practice. You tell people what? Skin your chicken. Buy skim milk. Sure eat less get, salt. Make sure you get enough protein. <laughs> make sure you have, yeah, right. <laughs> make sure you get enough protein to damage your kidneys and arteries. Mm -hmm. You know, I still feel that way. People, the most powerful people in the medical business are those who have command over the, the knowledge of human nutrition. My goodness, think about that. Having the knowledge over human nutrition, doesn't that sound powerful? You know, I mean, if you said, I'm the only one in the world who knows how to, what elephants are supposed to eat. Guess what? There are going to be no elephants around pretty soon if you don't ask me what they're supposed to eat. It's the same thing with people. Unless you start asking what people are supposed to eat to look, feel, and function their best, there aren't going to be any more healthy people around them. By goodness, there are hardly any healthy people I can see out there. You know, they tell me 80% of the people are overweight or obese. Half, half either have diabetes or pre-diabetic. Half will die prematurely of strokes and heart attacks. You know, 70, 80, 90% are constipated. Show me a healthy person. Oh, well, I'll show you somebody that follows the McDougal diet. That's what I'll show you. <laughs> or darn close to it. Ain't perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Alexandra. She's been following your diet. She's feeling great, um, but she's wanting to get pregnant. And so she's wondering if she's following the diet correctly, does she need to worry about folic acid or any other supplementation? It's my July 2011 newsletter. Look it up. It's a great, great read. It's about pregnancy. One of our family members was going through an early stage of pregnancy, and I wanted them to understand, you know, that they didn't have to worry about being pregnant and eating the right kind of diet. But I understood you remember, Mary, when we, I think it was when we had, uh, uh, well, uh, between Patrick and Craig, you know, you were. I was older pure. when we had Craig. I was much older when we had Craig. Yeah, so but they were in that, period, in, that period, in that period, let me tell the story or not. You sure? Yeah. Personal. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we had these two healthy children, uh, Craig and, and oh, uh, okay. Heather. Anyway. You sure? It's yeah, okay. It's All right. We had these two healthy kids, Craig and Heather. And, uh, you know, we eat a little bit here and there, okay? We were learning about a good diet. Didn't quite got it yet. And then what happened a couple of years later, uh, Mary got pregnant. And, uh, you know, she kind of talked to me and we knew what we looked at what we knew. And, you know, she said, well, I'm not sure. Everybody else says I should be eating meat and dairy and chicken and fish and stuff. And I said, look, Mary, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I'd like to, but I'm not, I won't get away with it. So uh, she lost the baby, uh, you know, an early miscarriage. And uh, yeah, it was tough, but, to say the least. But I'll tell you, when she got pregnant with Craig, she didn't ask me <laughs> what she was supposed to eat. You know, because she'd been cured of the idea that she needed more calcium, more protein, more meat, more dairy, having lost that baby. And I don't wish you that experience, but I can tell you, I, I became a real student of what pregnant women should eat. And just like when a horse gets pregnant you don't put them on cat food <laughs> you know i mean these uh, pregnancy is not a sickness ladies and gentlemen it's a, it's a state of health and you ought to learn it that way and if you don't eat the, the kind of diet i recommend you're going to gain more weight than you should that's most likely you're going to have a higher chance of getting eclampsia and preeclampsia which are kidney failure and blood pressure problems you'll have a great chance of gestational diabetes and you have an increased risk of having a deformation of your baby. That's right. Deformations of babies are caused by what you eat. You mentioned it, folic acid, okay? Uh, we supplement uh, the, the diet or whatever you want to call it, pre-pregnant women with folic acid. Women who are going to have babies could have babies because you have to do the supplementation before she gets pregnant. By the time she discovers she's pregnant, malformations already happen. Too late. So you have to get women on folic acid supplements before. Doesn't that sound a little silly? Don't you think there might be another way? How about, how can we just put them on 
the origins of folic acid. <laughs> it's called folate. And it comes from things called foliage. You got to get in the picture. In other words, the reason you have these uh, spinal tube defects, encephaly, spina bifida, cleft palate, heart deformations, is because you're eating a folate, folate, folic acid is the pill, folate's the plant form, a folate deficient diet. That's why. Okay, there are other things that happen when you eat the Western diet that cause malformations too, such as all the, uh, the pesticides and herbicides and other environmental chemicals. They, they damage the genes, they cause problems. And well, how do you get the least pesticide in your diet? Eat low on the food chain, you eat foliage. <laughs> anyway, the best diet for a pregnant woman is, uh, is our diet. We do add B12 to the diet as an added recommendation. Make some sense. And uh, you can walk around a little bit, get some sunshine. The chances are you're going to have an excellent baby. And you're not going to gain any extra weight. The other thing that was kind of fun about your pregnancy with Craig is I remember you, uh, you, you probably tell the story that I do about, about how Craig's pregnancy was different in the sense that you gained like 15 pounds. I gained 15 pounds, yeah. And when she walked out of the hospital, she weighed the same, pretty much the same as when she Got pregnant. <laughs> I got pregnant. And 50, you know, 15 days later, she was down to trim body weight. But I I, I, and, I like the story because I, I ate a lot. Yeah. And I remember this was, what, 40 years ago? Almost 40 years ago. So there weren't a lot of healthy snacks. So I uh, carried around bags. Remember rice cakes? Are they still around? Oh, yeah. Bags of rice cakes. I carried them around with me in my car. And you know how they're kind of like styrofoam almost? I had little pieces of rice cakes all over the inside of my car because I would eat rice cakes all the time so that I would be not hungry. And uh, I ate tons of them and never gained any weight. So the other thing I want to mention is uh, Mary, Mary went from home from the hospital about two hours after each of her deliveries. So that's what healthy women do is they work in the fields. <laughs> They have a baby, they strap the baby on their back or on their chest, and they get back to work. I didn't do you think that's probably, some, do you think it's probably something sexist in what I just said? <laughs> so I didn't do it like that. No, history. but that's throughout that's, that's history. What, <laughs> but that's what it that's what the other 99.999 people did uh, who walked this earth. They say they didn't have the luxury of laying around in the hospital for seven to ten. They didn't have hospitals. That was one of the most horrible things when, during my parents' time. They had to stay in the hospital for 10 days. Yeah, my mom did too. Treating women as if they were sick. That's that's really terrible. Hospital is a dangerous place <laughs> for babies and for pregnant women, for every, all of us. You know that. You've got germs there. <laughs> you got to have people with instruments there. They're going to get you. <laughs> you be careful. A whole bunch of people want to do things to you in a hospital. They're all trained to. Believe me, they think they're doing the right thing, too. And hopefully they are. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Yeah. Right? Hopefully they you are. You said hopefully they are. <laughs> Again, the best thing is to get out of the business. Good grief. You're not going to win by getting in the medical business or the drug company business. Just get away from these people. It's the food. It's the food. <laughs> You're being food poisoned. I can prove it to you in seven days. Give me 12. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, I, I'm here to exaggerate a little bit. You know, you know I told you 90, 90, 120 minutes on the blood clot, and I gave six hours. Well, <laughs> I want 12 days. I want 12 days of your time. That's all I want. And we're we're going to run a program in July where we're going to just take such good care of you in July. Yeah, it's yeah. filling up already. Well, that's good, Heather. I, I you know, I, I don't know. So it really troubles me why people can't see things the way I do. Which, of course, you know, from my personal point of view, I look at it as the correct. <laughs> Isn't that a flaw of, a, of a, most of us human beings? So anyway, I got this problem of thinking I'm right. <laughs> I think I'm right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, next question. This is from Devin. It's about melanoma. Uh, he says that uh, people with many dysplastic nevius are at an increase for melanoma. However, mm -hmm. you have stated that that's not so. So can you talk about that a bit? I, I would have to recall what I said. Uh, what we treat uh, these, uh, th these are like, they're called stage one melanomas, if I have them correct. Uh, these, uh, 
Are they like little moles? Well, they're moles that start to get a little bit dysplastic. They they start to grow a little the bit. The edges get a little yeah. fun looking. Yeah, you okay. want to see a dermatologist. And, and they'll cut it off. They'll do a biopsy. And they'll say it's like uh, one millimeter thick. Or I think uh, uh, when it goes on to stage two, it's like maybe two millimeters thick or 1.4 millimeters thick, depending upon the stage it's at. Uh, and I deal with a lot of people who have melanomas. And uh, there's a, a rule. And again, I'd have to look it up to make sure it's correct uh, that if you have stage one or uh, what you call a nevi, stage one melanoma that you treat it by just taking the local area out. That's all you do. You don't do any extensive surgery. But, you know, patients that doctors like believe the more you do, the better. And so I just had a patient a couple of weeks ago who had a superficial uh, melanoma stage one and the, their thickness of their lesion didn't indicate surgery, but he went through a whole dissection of his arm, which was very mutilating. He suffered chronic drainage and you know, he went through a lot. But the other thing he missed out on and his dermatologist missed out on that I'll share with you is that uh, any melanoma that I had with a patient myself included, I would treat with Aldera cream. You know, they're, they're, look up Aldera, A-L-D-A-R-A, -A -A, a melanoma. You'll find multiple articles on using Aldera cream as a standard medical therapy for melanoma. So you would use that even like as first line of for therapy me, for on, me, for on, me. if you had a mole on your arm that was discolored? Yeah, for think, me, me and my patients, and even if it was a deeper one. Because you see, the one you think you want to worry about, you want to worry about the the little cells getting out of the main tumor and going right. into the yeah. lymph system and going to the other parts of the body. Well, you know, uh, Aldera activates natural killer cells. So your killer cells go out and they get these cells. So, you know, I theoretically, I would consider that part of fundamental therapy, whether you would take this tumor off or not, is to treat them with... with and again, I'm not talking about something that's not that's really off the wall. You you look it up, melanoma and Aldera. You find a whole bunch of articles where doctors have used it, are using it, recommend you use it, and so on. But I don't see it used in practice much. Anyways, it's a pretty deadly disease, and uh, melanoma also has the highest rate of spontaneous regression of all tumors, which means they just go away in about five percent of the time. Why they go away? I don't know. But I can tell you one thing for sure. You're more likely to have a spontaneous regression if you're in good health and bad health. And I know <laughs> how to get in good health. Okay. <laughs> okay, next question. Intermittent fasting. Apparently, it's all the rage now. And those who promote it say that it's necessary to stay healthy. What do you think about that? Uh, it, I, you know, I've, I've done a little bit on fasting because I wrote this uh, or did this YouTube show on hunger. And, uh, you know, I tried to educate myself a little bit and that's probably as much as you could say about my education on fasting. I'm, it's It's very superficial. One thing that I have to note is that pretty much every religion has uh, fasting involved in their part of their practices. So, you know, 50,000 years of, of history can't be all wrong. So uh, there must be a reason that- There must that... be a reason. I, I don't know what it is though. I mean, there's a monastery in Spain where the, they fasted, they, they uh, lived longer, had less of a weight problem. Uh, you know, this well, is maybe different- if, if they're fasting, that means they're not eating the junk. Well, they get so then one out of one or one or two out of seven days that they're yeah. at least they get a no they cholesterol, get, low yeah. fat diet. Uh yeah, you know, it makes I think part of the reason might be you become more conscious of food and more, more appreciative of food during a fasting experience. Now that's different. Intermittent fasting is different than what Alan Goldhammer does, which is therapeutic fasting. And that's a whole different subject that I wouldn't dare address because uh even though I've spent a lot of attention to Alan Goldhammer's work. Over the last 35 years, um, you know, he, he takes it to a whole different level. But I mean, intermittent, intermittent fasting can be anything, right? As much as skipping one whole day of eating or one meal. Yep. It can so change. Can be dinner. Fasting. Dinner and yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of a day or two without anything but water. Yeah. 
or maybe a least use. I, I don't see it. I really don't see it as a, it's just like it goes along with my philosophy. I don't care when you eat, what time of the day you eat. I don't even care where you eat. All I care about is what you eat. You know, that's that's really the, the dominant factor there. And to get involved in things like uh, time of day and number of times a day, I, even though there's some importance to them, I don't, I don't think it should be well, dominant. See, I just anything. figure it's because for one meal or yeah. two meals a day, they're not eating junk. So therefore their their numbers look better. Well, or worse. You know, they 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 yeah, okay. We'll just kind of leave it at that. We don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Can you explain the difference between prostate cancer and breast cancer? I'd love to. Boy, I tell you, <laughs> that's that's one of the subjects, and it has to do with sexism with male dominance. Embryologically, by way of natural history, by means of early detection, by kinds of treatments, they're exactly the same. The breast is analogous to the prostate gland and all these measures that I just mentioned to you, as far as the cause, as far as how they grow, as far as the failure of early detection, as far as the failure of treatments go, same thing. But Prostate cancer has gotten a better, uh, a better set of recommendations than women with uh, the issues of breast cancer. Uh, men have been given a better opportunity when it comes to early detection. Uh, if a woman has a breast cancer, even a suggestion of breast cancer made by mammography or breast self-examination, which is usually the two ways that it's done, she's rushed off to further test and treatment. A man, a man for the last 20 years has been told, you have options. You could do watchful waiting, which is nothing. You can have radiation or you can have surgery. And unless you're a surgeon or a radiotherapist, if you're just a general doctor, most likely you're going to favor this, the recommendation of watchful waiting because you know, because you've studied it, just like the surgeons and the radiotherapists have studied it and they know that it makes no difference at all in survival, no matter how aggressive you are in treatment. But that message isn't given to women. Uh, you know, we have we have a campaign against breasts. So I don't know what it is. And the treatments are so aggressive. Yeah, but so, you have to, I think you're right about the, um, the sexist part. Yeah. But I have to think about back 40 years ago, whenever you heard about prostate cancer 40 years ago, it was always removal. Oh, yeah. Just like 40 years ago when you had breast cancer, it was always removal. And it's only been over the last few years that they found out that um, you can do the same thing with watchful waiting, but they don't have, they haven't found that or they haven't recommended that for women yet. Well, they should. They should have recommended it as of 1975 when Bernie Fisher did his classic studies. So and I should. About, well, like PSA tests. Well, that's another, you know, you, you don't find that the PSA doesn't go up until the prostate tumor has grown to the size of an eraser of a pencil. It's one centimeter in, in size before it, the, the PSA in the blood goes up. So it's a late stage disease. And that's why PSA doesn't work. 10% of the population is positive for PSA on random testing. If you take those who are positive for PSA on random testing, and you do biopsy. Now, biopsy isn't one needle. It's 16 needles shoved through your rectum into your prostate. Then 30% of you will turn out to be positive. But it depends on your age. Depends on your age. If you're my age, then the chance of being positive are somewhere around 80, 90, or 100%. You know, if you're 50, the chance of being positive are 50%. But on average, if they do a biopsy, 30% of the time, you're going to be positive. And then, boy, are you confronted with a whole <laughs> bunch of decisions. You're still being told by honest doctors, you could do nothing. You could go through aggressive surgery or radiation, which, by the way, has some pretty significant side effects to them. And so, you know, but I don't know, somehow mutilating a woman is, doesn't have the same value, at least in terms of how society or the medical profession treats the situations, which are essentially the same. Yeah, you sure don't hear about any women... Watchful waiting. watchful waiting. Well, except for my practice, and also, well, yeah, but... also Cleveland Clinic used to do that. Watchful mm -hmm. waiting in my practice is 
you cut the obvious cancer out. You do removal of the tumor with, with, with the clear margins. Now, maybe the reason that it's not done with men, well, why, why don't you do the same thing on men? Why don't you go in? How about, how about these analogies? How about this? We, we recommend breast self-examination for women, right? Aren't you told to brush it up, check your yeah. breast every month or two? Yeah. I, I, re, I have always refused <laughs> to recommend breast self-examination. For one reason, in 2001, the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Medicine said, don't do self-examination. And in 2010, the United States Preventative Services Task Force told Americans, don't do breast self-examination. I have always refused to ask a woman to do breast self-examination, and I will continue to refuse it. Sure I can say this? Well, you're going to anyways. Going to anyways. <laughs> Until you remove the gender the gender bias here, folks. You stiest. In other words, why not do prostate self-examination? <laughs> Come on, same same organ. You say you can't do it. I know you can. You can do a process. Oh, oh, that you don't want to do that. How about the smart ass men who say to me, "Well, I don't bother with my woman do her own exam. I do it for her." Ladies, it's time to step up to the mark. No thanks. There's a bias here. I didn't think I'd ever get to discuss that in public TV. <laughs> Only here. <laughs> That's right, Heather, only here. Okay, here's here's another fun topic. This is a good segue <laughs> into McDougal's Revenge. Can we talk oh. about this? This happens to a lot of people. You know, they're eating the whole food, plant-based, starch-based diet. And then all of a sudden <laughs> they have a meal that's off plan, even just a greasy meal. And they'll spend yeah. the rest of the afternoon on the toilet sometimes. Why does that happen? Well, because the bowel gets adjusted in about two to three weeks, it uh, the all, you grow all different kinds of bacteria in the bowel, and also you know by that time you're changing a lot of the metabolic processes that are going on, and I think as the fats and oils, you're not, you're not as uh, as good as absorbing the fats and oils that you eat, and it goes down and it causes bile acid secretion. Bile acids are very irritating to the bowel, and I I believe that that's what happens as you get a lot of bile acids uh, because you just challenge yourself with a high fat meal. And the longer you eat this way or the better you or the better you follow the program, sometimes the, the, worse, worse, the, the worse the revenge is. Or the worse the, because... meal, worse the meal too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as long as you're gonna, as long as you're gonna get McDougal's revenge, you might as well pick your favorite food. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, it'll it's, make it worth it, right? <laughs> it's a, a self-education program. It really is. It, you will find out. We don't have to tell you. All you have to do is kind of pick up the message and just, you know, when you do it, you get positive <laughs> rewards. When you don't do it, you get paid too. So it's a matter of, of, of uh, once you decide you're going to learn and you're a careful observer, you will teach by self-examination. <laughs> Thank you. Can you talk to us a bit about the Women's Health Initiative? Oh, yeah, this was done. Rowan Chabowski, who was on my TV show, uh, and also on my radio show. He's the head of the Women's Health Initiative, WHI. And uh, Ernst Winder was, uh, he was one of the big members. And I talked about Ernst Winder a lot during our program. And he was the head of the American Health Foundation back in the 80s. Uh, published 800 papers, uh, set up the journal Preventive Medicine, ran this big, big center. Anyway, they decided to do the Women's Health Initiative where they put them on a women, a whole bunch of women on a lower fat diet because we had enough information there that said it was the high fat Western diet that was giving women breast cancer and killing them. So they did this big study, well-designed study. Well, I had uh, Rowan Chabowski on my TV show and my radio show, and I had Ernst Winder on my radio show. I asked them, I said, why are you using a diet that is only moderately reduced in fat? The fat, they're teaching a 30% fat diet. You know, aren't the diet they really need to be on is only 7% fat. You know, you've cut the fat intake from 40% to 30% or at best 25%. Why are you doing this? You're wasting all this government money, all this time with people. Well, their answer is, well, we don't think we can get anybody to do this. Oh, and they're dying of breast cancer. That would be better. 
I mean, how would they know how to recommend a, the kind of program that we recommend? Look at all the years you've spent researching this. You can't expect somebody just. Well, I volunteered my services. No, oh, well. Anyway, uh, I don't. I don't know that I have that, those tapes anymore. We, we had a big cleaning here done in 2017. <laughs> That's a good way to look at uh, it. Anyway, I know the Women's Health <laughs> Initiative, and actually, uh, actually, eventually, the Women's Health Initiative, and I'm going to be showing this in that series of five lectures. I'll show you where the Women's Health Initiative did get survival benefits, even with the moderate low-fat intake that they offered. It did turn out to be a very positive thing. That was quite a few years ago. That was in the 80s. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That was on KGU Radio in Honolulu. I had my own show. Then I went on and I had, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, then I went on and I had, I had the uh, the biggest West Coast radio show, I don't know, ever. I, I was on uh, the major stations all over the West Coast, like KABC in Los Angeles, KSDO in S San Diego, KPIX in San Francisco, et cetera. All over the West Coast, I used to get 2,000 phone calls a night. And I was on for five years. Until my sponsors listened to me. <laughs> and I lost every show in three weeks. I just don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. We have 2,000 phone calls. We have more fun. We I was rated between number one and number seven during that five year period of time. I was really popular until my sponsors heard what I had to say. <laughs> they finally listened to your show. I was gone, man. I haven't been back <laughs> since. Thank God now for you. Now you're back on YouTube Live. Right. Wait till they find out what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, we've run out of time. Our hour is up. Is there anything you'd like to leave everyone with before we end? No, I'll just, you know, yeah, there are people you love, you know, your <laughs> friends and your relatives, and they're worth the trouble. And we try and provide for you as many teaching tools as we can to help you help the people that you care about. And the rewards will be huge. So, you know, get at it. Don't get me disappointed and uh, stick with us. We'll, we'll help you along. We've been doing, Mary and I have been at this for a half a century. So you can hardly believe it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, we are. I can old. believe it. We're not that old. So anyway, um, <laughs> you know, let's, let's cause a revolution. That's all I can say. And you better hurry up because we are that old. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. That was fun. Have Thanks a... for that hour. Yeah. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Next week we will be back live. Okay, and you have a program July seventeenth, right? July fourteenth through the twenty fifth, and then the uh -huh. series, the McDougal Medicine series that we've been talking about throughout this hour, that starts on July 29th. Yeah, oh, you're gonna have a busy July. <laughs> yeah, I'll be busy. I'll be busy. We're gonna give them all. We're gonna give them all the slides too, aren't we? All the slides. Yeah. Yep. So you'll have about, let's see, you're gonna have five, you'll have about somewhere between four and 500 slides with the best references that I know, the best education I've, I'm able to give. Be concise, won't be brand new, but it'll be worth, worth watching. I think the organization that I put this together is pretty hard to, uh, to deny. It's just like I told, shared you a little bit about heart surgery. And even though it's really complex, as I told you, you now understand why it doesn't work. They treat old fibrous scars and they ignore the part of the disease, which is the rupturing plaques. It's business. See you, <laughs> see you, see you in a week. Next Sunday. Thanks, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you next Sunday. Bye. Bye-bye.